This will be our last presentation before lunch. Um, our next presenter is uh, uh, Roman Rausch, who has been working on his language Talmud for the last two years, and he's going to introduce us to it today. My language is called Talmud, and my interest in Talmud is creating something which would be naturalistic, which no one has done before, quite the same way. And I'm a physicist, and so my inspiration actually came from quantum mechanics, believe it or not. Um, you might be familiar with the classical mechanics of school in theory, and the thinking there is that um, there are forces. So if you have an object, a force acts upon it, accelerates it, and it moves. So this translates into language as a kind of uh, agent-patient-like relationship or a uh, subject-object. And this is well, very predominant in languages. And in fact, languages tend to squeeze other relationships into it. We heard, we heard about it yesterday. So, for instance, um, um, I pick a potato. This would be a, a force acting upon the potato, but I like potatoes. It's the same kind of grammar, but it's not, not really a force acting upon it. And in quantum mechanics, the thinking changes completely, and you have no forces anymore. The only thing you have is states and transitions between states. And so, what I did first is I separated separated states out as a as a known part known part of speech. So the parts of speech and Tamil are now states and verbs. So this means that verbs um, only describe events or actions and states describe anything which is in some way constant in time. So this is a larger uh, category than you might expect. So in Tamil states include emotional states and anything, uh, any appearance, a color, shape, form, also spatial position, Possession is expressed by a state, ongoing action, so present progressive is essentially a state, and inaction is of course a state too. And, well, for the morphology of states, uh, uh, the important idea is that are scales. So states can, can uh, have scales attached, attached to them, and the scales can be one-sided, doublets, or two-sided. And that's what I'm going to talk, for, for what I'm going to talk about. So um, let's start with the one-sided scale. Um, well, most languages, well, actually all languages I know, um, they might have a grammaticalized plural, like English, but to, to quantify abstract, abstract ideas, they use some kind of metaphor. And it can be um, a size metaphor, like uh, high numbers, um, or rather height metaphor, high numbers, size metaphor, like big trouble, or kind of strength metaphor strong wind. But I don't think it, should, it has to be like that. So in Tamil, um, there is the suffix ne, which basically denotes the abstract idea that something is intense. And the suffix ve, which denotes that some, something is weak. And finally, uh, the suffix nis, which denotes that something is sufficient, uh, has, has sufficient intensity. And so we can arrange uh, these. All the suffixes, suffixes on a scale. So here's zero. So ne denotes a large value on the scale, you could say, where a small value, well, miss by the logic would denote an average value, and it actually derives etymologically it means middle. But since I, I don't believe it would be used that much, so the meaning has changed to sufficient value. Right, so um, as an example, it looks like this. So the word tra means size or volume, and tri means degree of speed, both are states. And applying the suffixes, you get tra large, tra was small, tra means sufficiently large, and tri in the past, tri was slow, tri means sufficient, sufficiently fast. Uh, but these tr translations are actually shortened, so you have to understand it, tra uh, the state of having a large size, something like that. And well, fun things you can do with it. Um, you can duplicate the suffix as a prefix uh, to, to gain emphasis. So netramne would be very large, netrim very fast, and so on. Vetra were very small, vetri were very slow, and uh, well, mistramis and mistrimis. I don't actually know how to translate it. Kind of emphasizes the, the sufficientness. So it's like. Um, Mistremis would, would mean something like 
uh, it's, it's fast enough, all right, or it's fast enough I'm telling you, and we know how to take it. And another thing you can do is you can add a component T to, to the process, and you gain the notion of a string value. Um, and if states correspond to adjectives in other languages, this will basically be the superlative. So, prominent, largest, being the fastest, probably smallest, be with slowest. Right, so far so good. This was the one sided scale. Um, now we have the doublets. Yesterday we had some triplets. Um, and here the, the basic idea is that, well, some states that do not actually run a continuous scale, but rather between two values. And the scale looks like that. There's one value denoted by, by the vowel A and another one by the vowel I. So the typical example would be uh, HAL, state of being alive or dead. Obviously, it can be very dead or a bit alive. And long state of being awake and asleep or asleep. And these vowels can be prefixes, suffixes, or infixes. So in the, in the case of HAL, it's a prefix. We get a HAL, alive, a be HAL, dead. And in the case of long, it's a infix, and we get a long, awake, a long, asleep. Right. And finally, there is the two-sided scale, and it's basically a combination of both before. So we have here's a zero, it's actually denoted by the prefix null. We have a, a positive part uh, with a, a negative part with i. Oh, sorry. Um, I call this uh, the signal of the state. Just to invent the Latin word. So this this would be the positive signal. This would be the negative signal. Okay, so we have the, the, the two parts, and again, the, the values on it. So, um, for example, uh, proofs uh, as a state means vertical position. Vertical position is normally measured on some kind of, kind of zero, mostly the ground. And you have, you have a generic, uh, again, as an infix, parus, position above, pirus, position, so that's actually a top and face level, position below. Um, and then the, with the suffix ne, the m is, is a drop after the consonant. So we get parus ne high above, uh, pirus ne deep below, parus ne slightly above, and pirus ne slightly below. And well, adding mul, it becomes mul parus. It's essentially, well, zero, really mostly on the ground. <coughs> right. But then you might have noticed that there's actually a particular group of nouns that is quantified in just the same way. So those are mass nouns, so nouns which um, are measured in, in volume continuously. And so uh, they um, gain just the same suffixes. So a typical example is pial, water. And it becomes pial, much water. Pial means a sufficient amount of water, or pial, very little water. Uh, however, um, the natural scale of a uh, of, a, of a mass now does not have to be the size of the volume. So, for instance, the word lache also means water, but water with a natural scale of temperature. So we get applying the signum vowels, we get placha warm water, and placho cold water. And it's slightly regular here, with the vowel u instead of i. And then you can form um, just, just like before, plachane would be very hot water, plache means sufficiently warm water and so on. And well, the, the, the word plache itself is kind of uh, difficult to translate. It's like water, if you think of it, it's something that has temperature. So for instance, the sentence, um, cooking requires water, would probably use plache, but the sentence, um, fire extinguishing requires water, would rather use plache. Okay. Then there are nouns which can have signal, and those are the, the little parts of the body. And the idea behind it is that there is a natural scale to, to, to those um, body parts, um, namely the, the left right direction, or in the case of lips, the, the up down direction. Even though it's, it's actually not, not this way, so if you, come, you, if you cut your right uh, hand off, Expand it to, to the left arm, you don't get the left hand. But for the purpose of language, that's how it is. 
So um, you get the same vowel infix. Uh, the example I used is Krose wing. So you get Karose right wing and Kirose left wing. And your Petle lip, you get Petle upper lip and Petle lower lip. So the right side is seen as positive, or the upper side also positive, and the other one is negative. And now um, another fun, fun thing you can do with it, you can actu actually superpose both vowels into a diphthong. And what you get is a, is a Dvanva compound. Uh, a Dvanva compound comes from Sanskrit and is a compound where both constituents um, are equivalent. So neither of those modifies the other one. So in this case, we had uh, Parus Pirus above below and Pyrus now means both above and below. And Achalichal, that the uh, becomes Achal, both dead and alive. So it makes sense. But with, with the body parts, uh, you actually get uh, the ordinary dual. So uh, Kairose becomes both wings, the two wings of an animal, and Petlai becomes both ribs. And actually, languages which have a dual and uh, which slowly dies out um, might keep the dual for, for, for body parts, or for natural pairs. Uh, and well, in timing, uh, the only way to form a, a, a dual is, is for uh, non natural pairs only. So you can, can just take two nouns and form a dual from it, but you can take two body parts. And the idea, again, is, is the scale. Okay. Um, the examples before were all on, a, on, a, on an absolute scale, but if you want to compare the objects, you have to go to a relative scale. And things change a bit. Uh, first off, you don't need uh, the signal vowels. You just use the vowel E to denote a relative value. And the meanings of the suffixes also change. So N now denotes uh, a value which is higher, and the value, and the value which is lower, NIS denotes a value which is the same. So basically, it becomes um, Perus as a word would mean relative vertical position, and perusne means higher than perusnes on the same level as and perusne. <clears throat> so I think it's kind of neat. You don't need to, to introduce anything new. Right, and at last I would uh, like to at least outline how, how the grammar of the states works. So the basic idea is a post position called Neuer which indicates being in a state. So before we had achal, state of being alive, and this becomes achal neuer, in a state of being alive, which is now a predicate. Now this, of course, derives from, from or is, is close to English, English constructions like being fear, being jeopardy, and so on. Uh, the difference is that the English constructions are actually, again, metaphors. So essentially, a state is thought of as a scenario where someone is. But uh, Neuer is not a metaphor, it just embrace the, the, the basic notion that something is a mistake. Um, and the other difference is, of course, that this construction is just basic and fundamental and appears in every second sentence. Um, and I think to, to um, develop something which would be naturalistic, but which no one has done before, uh, would be to, to look at constructions which, which are rare or somehow borderline and just promote them to, to basic and fundamental. For instance, in Crane's describing morphosyntax, there is a nice example of uh, a relativity in English. If you take a uh, transitive verb like to employ, you have the agent, the employer, uh, the, the patient, the employee. But if you take uh, an intransitive verb like to, to escape, you don't get the escaper, but the escapee, so it aligns with the, with the patient. So uh, suppose that there were no ergative languages around, you could actually uh, get the idea to, to make an ergative con length just by looking uh, at the English in theory. Well, and, well, the other example here is slightly different. If you have a profession, for instance, Hecker means writer, and Hecker Neuer means in the state of being a writer or in the capacity of a writer. Okay, and uh, this is the most important post position, and the second uh, important, most important post position is Mere, and it indicates the idea of changing into a state. However, uh, changing into a state is actually an event, and as I said before, events uh, can be 
um, described or are described by verbs. And so you have um, two constructions now. So Pirus uh, meant position below. So you can say Pirus meta change into a state of P in position below. Or you can use the P state of verb. So on Pirus, we write the verb Spirusum, which also means the same. But the difference is that you use a, a verb that indicates a volitional and controlled action. So Spirusum would mean something like to descend. And Pirus meta is a, well, um, uncontrolled action it would mean something like the fall. Right, and um, as a final example, um, uh, rather peculiar example, uh, consider the, the state rot, which means degree of reversibility. So if you're still with me, the rot means reversible state and the rot irreversible state. Now we get the, the suffixes. And we get the rock web irreversible for a short time. Oh, the idea that something is weak. And then we get the T, and it adds the notion of an extreme value. So the rock web would be something like irreversible for the shortest time. And um, with the noun, with the, with the words black pain and foul future state, it's in a situation where you're in a hospital and the nurse takes blood from you, a blood sample from you. And you might say, the rock that led to power matter, which is properly translated as, it will change into a future state of pain, which is irreversible for an extremely short time. <laughs> or in, proper, in proper English, it's going to hurt us a little bit. <laughs> yes, and that's all. I have. First, I, I actually was having this conversation with. John had a little bit. Are you familiar with Quinn? Uh, just in general. Okay, well, you should take a look because uh, I don't know if other people have this, but looking at this, first thing I think of is Ikuil. Um, the One of the questions <laughs> I had was, isn't it still a metaphor to, for example, you, you, you have the, the three uh, uh, names in Wick, mm -hmm. and let's say the, the first is applied to size, the name means great size, and then um, with the other, great speed. Isn't that still a metaphor? Uh, that is, it's not quite the same thing to say uh, something's size, you know, is very large. It's not quite the same thing to say something's speed is very great. Uh, I mean, technically. But, or, 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 I don't know. The idea, and the idea is that there's a natural scale to, to a state. And you just vary a value on the scale. Right. So I, it's, I, I guess the question is about the natural scale. Is it, is it natural for us humans, or is it natural objectively? Mm -hmm. Or does that not make sense? Does it make a difference? Okay. Well, eh, maybe. All right. Well, I'll, I will move on. I see a question behind me. Sorry, but my question is a bit philosophical. Do you feel that um, your language can be translated into a language which has um, nouns and verbs and actors and Asians? I'm not sure, but maybe oh. not. Maybe not every nuance will be it can be translated. Can be translated. Translated. But it's it's true for all languages. Just a quick question, first quick question about the grammar is, uh, I've noticed that that's a synonym of yours. In some cases where it was posed as an infix between the first two uh, uh, <coughs> consonants, but sometimes at the end of the word or something. Yeah. Uh, when do you know where you put it? Uh, it depends on the root. Um, if you have a, a, a stop, as a, yeah, a stop, a, a continuum, like root, it becomes an infix. Um, well, in some cases, it's a regular word. For instance, the example was plach, plache. Uh, well, the root is plach, but it can cannot end in plach. In, in, uh, so you, conveniently, it's, it's a suffix in this case. But rus can end in s, so it comes by rus. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, and uh, as you you talked about uh, Prahe, you had that example indeed that uh, in some cases uh, water had uh, a scale of uh, of size. In other cases, water has a scale of warmth. But you can actually do that with well, with nearly any, anything and everything, and uh, with plenty of kinds of scales. So, is there uh, do you have do you have many of those things? Is it regular or is it just irregular? And some words have uh, those scales and others don't. It's just a question of practicability. So some some natural scales are scales are more practical than others. Well, it, it kind of depends on the, uh, uh, what you are talking about. I mean, probably a, a, a scale of temperature for stars wouldn't be that interesting for the uh, for the coroner or for uh, for somebody who's just interested in uh, in poetry or literature. But for an astronomer, it's quite important. Well, yes, but. As the language developed, no one was interested in stars, and so the natural scale of temperature of stars did not develop. Okay, I understand. So it's, 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 it's the nice way out with languages. This was just isn't developed. That's why I use that you know, that excuse quite often, so it's, it's okay. Just a, last, just a reminder, but I just have to take exception on left being negative. You should have done the other way around. The same. The same. Um, actually, I saw my field stamps first. Um, I remember that uh, a language which I read of in the um, Auckland book, um, in the land of invented languages, had um, a similar system about um, yeah quantities. Um, were you inspired by that in, um, in any ways? Uh, no, I honestly didn't know any other comment when I started to do it. Ah, cool. Um, the other question, um, are there any um, larger texts in the language so I can um, maybe um, see a gloss and um, can read a bit more about it? Yes, on my website, well, the largest text is the Babel text and the Mountain in the Sun. More than that. <laughs> um, I, I thought that was all very wonderful. and. I liked the, um, the, the absolute scale, I guess you called it, with that little superlative T. And you showed an example of the one at the small extreme and of the, or the low intensity and the high intensity, but you didn't show an example of the middle intensity with that T. And so I speculated that if you had that form, it would probably mean something like optimal. Uh, I don't have the form, sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, you might consider adding it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I just thought about that, and I thought it was pretty cool. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, hello. Um, actually, it might seem a little egocentric, but if it was only the second language that popped to my mind when I saw the sort of scale. The first one was uh, Ngai, which is one of my languages. Um, and I also tried to have this kind of um, regularity to, to um, look at several types of scales. Um, maybe I had a little different focus. Um, I was, let's say, anti-inspired by some of the engines around that um, um, removed um, words like bad to have something like ungood. Um, so I tried to have uh, lexical words for both sides of the scale. Um, if um, there was no neutral way to distinguish the two. So for example, you had the left arm and the right arm, but it's totally arbitrary which one you would assign the E a morpheme and the A a morpheme. Um, so, in this case, I, I would have two, mm, two lexical entries, one for left and one for right, and not one for, um, well, for example, a wing and then left wing, right wing. Did you think about this? Um, I also noticed you had something like um, yes or no scales marked with, with, um, with this, right? Uh, well, about the left, right, it just so happens that this is exactly the way it is in natural languages. So, for instance, sinister means just left in Latin, so it has a bad connotation, and dexterity has a positive connotation. 
Yeah, but um, that's exactly what I didn't want. So no, again, I I try to be naturalistic. Okay. Good <laughs> excuse. <laughs> <laughs> I have to mention it does it does look it does remind one of an enchilang, but I guess it's an enchilang with naturals. <laughs> <laughs> Can signal models uh, be suffixed? Uh, yes, yes, they are in Lacha um, and Lacha. Uh, how do we differ uh, if they, they are suffixes or prefixes? Uh, it depends on the kind of root. So, uh, yes, if you have a stop and a continuum like rules, you can easily infix. Uh, if you have just, just the, in, the, in the beginning a uh, stop, uh, or a fricative like hal, you have to use um, a prefix, a hal, and so some cases are just irregular. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? All right, thank you very much. <laughs>